Did you know that yearly Medicaid renewals will start again soon? This means millions of people who were enrolled in Medicaid during the pandemic may no longer be eligible for coverage. If this may impact you, the good news is you have options. Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield can help answer your questions so you can find an affordable health plan for you and your family. We want you to feel confident you're covered. Click to learn more. Policy exclusions and limitations apply. Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield is the trade name of Community Insurance Company. Save big on select Whirlpool and Maytag appliances at Lowe's. Right now, get deals on top items like the Whirlpool Stainless Steel Kitchen Suite and Maytag Pet Pro Laundry Pair that removes five times more pet hair. Plus, get free delivery when you spend $396 or more. Shop appliances for less in-store or online at Lowe's. Comparing normal cycle with Pet Pro Filter and option to cycle using traditional agitator without Pet Pro Filter and option. Results will vary based on fabric and type of pet hair. Exclusions apply. See Lowe's.com for details. Offer ends 3-8. Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick. Uh, we're here to continue our discussion of that one play. And in this case, that one play is perhaps the most famous in Ravens history, the Mile High Miracle, uh, that eventually would uh, uh, bail out the Ravens from uh, having a Ray Lewis retirement fest in that Denver game in 2012, send them the AFC Championship, and eventually the Super Bowl, where they were, were uh, winners in Super Bowl 47. Joining me here to talk about it is Brian Jens. Brian, how are you doing? I'm good, Ken. Thanks for having me. Uh, uh, Brian, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, where, the, where people can talk football with you online in particular. Sure. So um, I'm not a Baltimore native. I'm actually from um, Milwaukee County in Wisconsin. Um, not really a born and raised Ravens fan. When I was growing up, I uh, when I was in my teenage rebellious years, my rebellious phase was to cheer for the Ravens instead of the Packers. Huh. So um, my family and I went to a trip, uh, family trip to Baltimore. I bought a, like a T-shirt and that was that. So um, not sure exactly what year that was, but I at least have been a Ravens fan since uh, maybe a couple of years after that they moved to Baltimore. So, All right, that's interesting. Um, active mostly on, on Facebook at Brian Jens or um, I interact sometimes on Twitter at Brian Jens VGC. All right. Outstanding. Well, we appreciate having you, Brian. Uh, a little bit of the setup for this game, and I think a lot of people know it, but the Ravens had met the Broncos during the regular season. It did not go well for the Ravens in a game where they sat out a lot of their regulars. They lost 34-17, I believe, but they got – drubbed a lot worse than that in in truth be told um the uh uh they came into this game as nine point underdogs they had not beaten peyton manning since 2001 so it's been 11 years since they've beaten Pey peyton manning at this point they, they actually yeah 11 and and uh uh the game started off very poorly for the ravens of course they they didn't move the ball enough on the opening kickoff and then gave up a 90 yard punt return to trinden holiday uh, to go down seven, but uh, but they recovered from that. A couple quick touchdowns went ahead. Uh, what were you noticing about the general tenor of the game early on? So, I mean, it was kind of a back and forth game, right? So, like, if you look at the box score, right, the box score would have told you that that it was kind of a tit for tat, right? That the first quarter, both teams had scored fourteen points. So, you know, um, Denver went up fourteen points. Uh, or Denver went up seven points, and then, you know, the Ravens responded with that interception by Corey Graham. Um, and then every quarter, you know, each team scored seven points. Um, you know, looking at the box score only, you wouldn't have known that prior to the end of the fourth quarter that the Ravens were at, in the position that they were. It was, a, it was truly a great back-and-forth game, extraordinarily cold that day, coldest I've ever been at a football game, part of it being that it was a extra long game going into the second sure. overtime, but but windy and and a very uh, uh, low uh, wind chill. It was a game where Flacco's weather resistance and, and some of that 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 made him great in January uh, really showed through. He he had a, a a very solid game despite the weather. In fact, he had a very good game despite the weather. Whereas Peyton Manning was completely affected by it. And he was supposedly was dumping his arm in ice before the game to try and get ready to play under these conditions. Uh, whatever he did, he, he was fairly noodle armed during the game. It was a fairly, uh, you know, quick, short pass 
uh, game that he was throwing that, that I think was consistent with a lot of who Manning was later, late in his career. He also had a couple of really, you know, cool touch passes that in some of those touchdowns. So he had one in no Sean Moreno in the end zone. He also had another one to a, a wide receiver, I think, um, where, I mean, it, it looked like vintage Tom Brady or vintage uh, Peyton Manning at, at certain points. So if, if he was affected by the cold, it maybe didn't always look like it. I, I I I don't disagree entirely, but by the time it got to overtime and later in that game in particular, it didn't look yes. like he had much juice uh, juice left. And a, a lot of their offense that damn quick, of course, came from Trend and Holiday, who had the two big returns. Uh, right. You you mentioned something at our production meeting though about the Ravens going after Champ Bailey. Yeah. So so if you if you looked at um, every play that was going on throughout the game, you you noticed that at least that part of the Ravens game plan had been to try to, to push the ball downfield. So on, I noticed that throughout the four quarters, there were several different occasions in which they had tried to push the ball at least 20 yards down the field. Not all of them obviously were successful, but you know, um, I think part of the game plan was probably to try to, to challenge the secondary of, of the, um, of the Broncos and, and specifically champ Bailey was beaten a couple of different times, at least for touchdowns. Mm-hmm. So once once uh, down the middle of the field by Torrey Smith, that was the one that got the Ravens back in the game. A nice 59-yard throw from Flacco to Smith, or just beaten deep, did not have help. And then down the right sideline at the end of the half where uh, Torrey Smith adjusted back to the football, which that is not Champ Bailey to be not in position to make a play on that ball. He'd been very good about that in his career, generally speaking, and uh, and got himself overran the play slightly uh, on that one in a, in a way that yeah. uh, allowed Torrey Smith to adjust back. That was anyway, good adjustment by Torrey Smith to be able to come up, come up over Champ Bailey at, on the catch there at the very end. Mm-hmm. Anyway, we're back. We'll fast forward to 35-28, and the, the, the Broncos went ahead with uh, – with a few, with eight minutes ago or so, if I recall correctly, or earlier in the fourth quarter, the Ravens had more than one chance at it, if I recall. But they they came back with another chance with about a minute and fifteen to go after the Broncos declined to throw the ball on third down to try and get the first down. Right. So they, it was a third down. They, they ran the ball to try to close the clock. And I think what's important to to remember too is prior to that, right? So the the previous possession, you know. Um, on a third down, um, Jacoby Jones drops a pass from Flacco that would have continued a play. Um, uh, I think they were in field goal range that they ended up going for fourth down on that mm-hmm. drive. Um, and so, like, Jacoby Jones doesn't have a have a catch at this point in the time of the game. You know, he hardly been targeted. And, and, and so they've been – been, Somewhat successful at moving the ball down the field, but Jacoby Jones hadn't been part of the offense at that point. Yeah, so was on that third and five play at the Denver 31 with 3.22 to go. And that looked like maybe not the ball game because he had fourth and five, but it was an awfully important play. Uh, and right. then four, fourth and five, he threw incomplete to Pitta. I, I seem to remember that ball being a kind of a low throw, if I recall, that Pitta just couldn't quite dig out. Anyway, that's my yeah. visual memory. I may be thinking of another one, to be to be honest. And then Denver did get a first down on their drive. They got one on second down, and they just continued to run the drive. They ran the ball all five plays that they had it. Uh, they right. got the ball to the 47, punted, and the Ravens took over with 109 remaining in the game. It set us up a little bit and take us through the big play. Yeah, so um, so uh, first down, I think they, they um, threw the ball. Maybe I think it was, it was an incomplete pass. And then second and 10, um, Flacco uh, decided if nobody was open, so Flacco ran the ball on a, on, um, on a scramble, got to about the 30-yard line. They were obviously no timeouts left. Denver had two timeouts left. And so they, they were in no huddle. And so they set up real quick. Um, they were in 11 personnel. Uh, so if you look on the right side, on the right side, you had Jacoby Jones on the outside with Dennis Pitta um, on the inside slot there. On the left side, you had Torrey Smith on the outside, and I think um, Anquan Bolden was on the slot on the left side. And Denver was playing um, – so they were, they were rushing three with eight eight back. So one of those one of those people in – one of the middle linebackers ended up um, – after the snap, ended up covering Ray Rice as he entered the, you know, um, the middle of the mm-hmm. – um, coming into 
after moving past the offensive line. And then, um, so you had seven players that were playing back and Jacoby Jones on the outside, on the right side was running a stutter and go. Um, Carter, number 32 was the one that was covering him. He had gotten past him. Um, I think 15 yards down the field. So about the 45 yard line, he had gotten past him and he was running a stutter and go. And at that point, after he had run the stutter and was then going down the field, that's when Flacco stepped up into the pocket um, and was able then to throw the ball downfield. At that point, Raheem Moore, number 26, was the safety that was on that side. And what, as I was looking at that play several times, he had, he had a, I think he had an option based upon where he was standing to go. He had to choose an angle on which the mm-hmm. ball was thrown. And he show, he chose a very short angle to be able to try to respond to the ball. Uh, so, so much to unpack in, in what you just said. So- if you're thinking about becoming a nurse, it's important for you to know not all nursing degrees are the same. Xavier University gives you the power of three. Choose from three start dates and three in-person learning sites to prepare as a holistic nurse, helping people improve health, wellness, and well-being. The 16-month Accelerated Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Xavier, an exceptional degree that prepares exceptional nurses. Search Xavier ABSN. Save big on select Whirlpool and Maytag appliances at Lowe's. Right now, get deals on top items like the Whirlpool Stainless Steel Kitchen Suite and Maytag Pet Pro Laundry Pair that removes five times more pet hair. Plus, get free delivery when you spend $396 or more. Shop appliances for less in-store or online at Lowe's. Comparing normal cycle with Pet Pro Filter and option to cycle using traditional agitator without Pet Pro Filter and option. Results will vary based on fabric and type of pet hair. Exclusions apply. See Lowe's.com for details. Offer ends 3-8. Did you know that yearly Medicaid renewals will start again soon? This means millions of people who were enrolled in Medicaid during the pandemic may no longer be eligible for coverage. If this may impact you, the good news is you have options. Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield can help answer your questions so you can find an affordable health plan for you and your family. We want you to feel confident you're covered. Click to learn more. Policy exclusions and limitations apply. Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield is the trade name of Community Insurance Company. There's so many things happening on that same play, but a right. couple of things I'd respond to. The first was four, four vertical routes. So th- they had Ray Rice as an underneath right. guy. And I think Flacco probably had a pretty good chance to end up throwing to him there, but he actually identified the play. He said, based on how Moore was in terms of reacting, but he thought Moore was responding to a, an underneath route, which what the hell is he doing there? And the guy who wouldn't let him forget about that is Dan Deerdorf. Dan Deerdorf was all over it. I, I love Dan Deerdorf's energy uh, announcing a football game. I, I, I know there's a lot of fans who, who disagree with me on this, but he, he, he tells things in very straightforward terms. He's unbelievable technical asset. If you ever understood what the guy is doing behind the scenes, um, in particular with, with working with Dick Enberg, he's really the technical asset. Enberg is a, is a, um, a nice voice. Uh, but but the, the the things he does at ground level, trying to understand the camera, telling him to go to a different camera, that kind of stuff, as he's reviewing a play to set up a highlight sure. while they're at commercial, is, is Deerdorf was amazing at. Um, a, anyway, Dan really laid into more about that. Deep outside is deep outside. You know, you can and he just right. that's his play. He can, you know, so I just I can hear his pleading voice. You know, as if he's he a wasn't, defender. He wasn't deep or, enough. He should have been. <laughs> Yeah. The, the other thing is the you mes- mentioned the rush three and drop eight. And that, that's always a risk in these situations when defenses don't rush four. And, and they often do this. They often rush three. But when you when you do it, you typically allow the quarterback a path to walk back up in the pocket, which does two yeah. things. First of all, it extends the play. Second of all, it allows the release point to be as far forward as possible so that the, that ball can travel as far in the air. And I, that was a cold day. And even though it was Denver, um, uh, that was a, a monstrous throw that went about about 57 yards in the air, if I recall, doing the the, the calculation of the hypotenuse on the play. So it was a yeah. certain number of yards downfield and a certain yards to the right. And, you know, you calculate on, on But in terms of the, the, the yards in the air, it was about 57 yards. We've seen some longer throws from Lamar. But it was still a remarkable uh, throw that day for Flacco, and in, in particular with uh, with those freezing temperatures. 
where, where I calced it at was that, so Flacco threw, so, I mean, the play started from the 30 yard, their own 30 yard line. And I think Jacoby Jones ca- caught it at about the 19 yard line of the opposite team of, of the Broncos. So yeah, your, your high trajectory, you know, throw caught it 50 yards down the field and, and just a very poor angle taken by Raheem Moore at that point. Mm-hmm. And Jones on, on the catching end, that was also a challenge there. Jacoby, obviously a punt return man, most of his career uh, had always done that uh, well. And not really known for his receiving skills. Had a lot of drops in his career, frankly. But that ball took a similar trajectory to a punt where nobody tricky is trying to throw it. You know, they're basically you're throwing a spiral. So it's not Sam Cook with right. some end over end or you, weird English that's going to backspin the ball. It's just a, it's just about as easy a punt as you can as you can pick up. And if I believe it is very close or it actually did scrape the front of his helmet as he came in and cradled the ball for the catch. Uh, it's one of these things where that was his helmet was actually something that got Jacoby Jones in trouble from time to time. Well, especially if you, if you look on early on from the game, right, that that after the first touchdown that Denver scored on the subsequent um, kickoff, right, he fumbled, fumbled the ball. So, like, he, his hands in that game weren't totally trustworthy. So the fact that he that he was able to make that catch, you know, may have surprised some individuals um, going into that play. It it, uh, it it was a it was they ended up they ended up starting on the six yard line on that drive, and then they ended up scoring on the on the first long touchdown anyway to to get the game tied. But yeah, Jacoby didn't have a didn't have a great game to that point. Uh, he would certainly have a great Super Bowl. Uh, I don't remember him having a, any big contributions to the AFC Championship game, but I may be wrong about that. He may have had a couple of big catches that converted first downs or some such. Uh, it didn't score, and uh, it's it was a, a a postseason for the ages, nonetheless. It's one of the greatest Ravens offensive postseasons, even though it had just a few plays, kind of like Shannon Sharp's 2000 in terms of, right. of being made up of just enormously game changing plays on, on offense. And uh, really is one of the one of the best ones, uh, uh, you know, after after Flacco and probably after Sharp in terms of uh, a great offensive uh, performances in a postseason. Couldn't agree more. Would you have given uh, Jacoby Jones the MVP in the Super Bowl? It had been very close, right? So he he gets the he gets the uh, the touch the long touchdown there. He gets the um, you know obviously the putt return there, but. Um, it's hard to discredit Flacco in the way that he played throughout the entire postseason to not to not give him that as well. Yeah, I I agree, and I think the the Flacco conversion on third and one to, to throw ahead the other three touchdowns, no interceptions. Obviously, he's he managed the game just fine in terms of being impacting a lot of plays. But that third and one play where he threw to Bolden for the first down that really right. helped Alvarez was one of those great. Uh, uh, the trust players. that he had in Bolden was was in, was immense. I mean, it just it it's. When they call him Joe Cool, I mean, I think it's one of it's that moment that that did you realize that he was, you know, he was never phased. He was unflappable <laughs> by certain people in in certain situations. I I personally I love the other nickname for this play. I, I much prefer the f bomb to the Mile High Miracle. I I don't like paying homage to the city. I mean, the Mile High Miracle <laughs> has nothing to do with us. Why do why do we want that? You know, it's like the. Uh, it, it's somebody else is going to have a crab fest or something if they come to Baltimore, and that's obviously not going to not going to work unless it's a certain player or whatever. But uh, it's it's uh, we just you know I, I don't I don't need Mile High to be part of it. If if it was the f bomb, everybody's going to know what it was. And and, and so I think right. the really good really good ones are named like that. They're not uh, uh, they're not done otherwise. But anyway, it, uh, it it lost out pretty quickly. People were trying to stake their claim into what it was. But but uh, I really I was a big proponent of the f bomb. You, you know what's funny, Ken is is after that play, you, what's what's really interesting is so with thirty th- seconds left to go, you know they had Denver had two timeouts left. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know to be able to move the ball and and they and they. They kneeled the ball to be able to go to overtime. They didn't even give themselves a chance to try to like go down the field to like try to score. So it's like, yeah, you know, in, in a Super Bowl season, I think you have to be cognizant of, of of the lucky moments. Like the team has to be more than just good. They have to be lucky in certain circumstances. Who knows yeah, what I, Peyton Manning would have done in that last 30 seconds with two timeouts. 
So uh, just, absolutely, yeah. he, he wasn't having a great game though, and and I think that the the, the Broncos coach, and I'm forgetting who that was at the time, the, the, but the, but the Broncos coach said this was a time where we were we were down. It's like we were on the canvas. We needed to get that game to overtime and just and just restart, you know. And and I I don't. I really just don't agree with that. You're you're playing in Denver. You got a chance for a long field goal. You got a guy who had a, a history of 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 long field goals um, there as your kicker. It it just struck me as a as a very foolish decision. And um, Greg Gumble, who did the game with Deardorff in this particular case, was all over him about it. He said, "Is it just me, or do they get very conservative over this?" And uh, I, I, odd oddball choice in uh, in that choice. Well, I'll just say here in Wisconsin, having watching watched Aaron Rodgers fairly, fairly often, you know, to be able to see him move down the field with seconds left. It just, it just, it boggles my mind just to think that like they had a chance to do something with it. Right. And they, and they instead chose to go to overtime. Well, th- good news for us and good news for Ravens fans everywhere. Cause the overtime period itself was, was uh, a topic for another day, but, uh, but just wonderful. Brian, just great having you on to talk about this. Got a really good understanding of the of the play and 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 what went on in the game in general. Obviously, really appreciate how prepared you were coming into this. Uh, other folks out there, if you'd like to do what Brian just did and go over a single play in Ravens history, you can be as prepared or not. You could be a little bit less, but uh, but know what you want to talk about in terms of the particular play. Know your own angle towards it. Know what you were doing at the time and why it was special to you or whatever else. You be you. Anyway, but I'd love to talk to as many people as possible about this series. We have a huge number of them planned for this offseason, but I can always take more. And there aren't there a lot of the great plays have still not been taken. And I'll be posting a few every day on Twitter uh, as options for people to uh, to still take among those who that, that haven't been done. If if you need a little a, a little prodding, but Brian, thanks again for coming on. Thank you, Ken. We'll I really appreciate everything that you do. You make you 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 made me a, a very smarter Ravens fan with everything that you've done. So thank you for all that you do. Thank thank you for saying so. And we'll talk to you next time on Film Study. <laughs>